we are discussing about the budget that was tabled to the parliament yesterday joining us and glad to have once again on our podcast dr ptr thank you so much sir for uh, taking away your time to join us on this podcast uh, what are your reactions on the budget uh, are you also going to give it 12 out of 10 like what we are seeing all around on television channels no of course i'm not but i have a greater concerns than uh, than that you know i worry that uh, these budget presentations are descending into farce instead of uh, substance or instead of uh, kind of value add you know when you have the finance minister of the country talking about what container she carries the papers in or whether she has been smart enough to issue it as pdf files and read it out of a tablet It demeans the whole process, as far as I'm concerned. Right? I mean, you are talking about some serious things that affect the lives of 1.4 billion people. So you go through this charade. It, it's it's like a, it's like a third-rate farce, where you start uh, focusing on the color of the bag and the, you know, is it a briefcase or a bag, and is it PDF or is it tab? And then you know, you have your usual suspects who come out and say, "What a fantastic budget! Oh, is everything we ever had." and then you have inane random noises like it was a once in a century budget i mean the country is only like 73 74 years old what do they mean by once in a century budget every budget is once in a century budget we are not a century old you know so i i worry that people who are used to demagoguery and kind of juvenile sloganeering and kind of uh, uh, you know the equivalent of soap advertising are uh, taking over the responsibility of serious uh, business like running a country and they are woefully lacking it so what would be your main takeaways or what was completely disappointing or not bad as far as the budget is concerned look i think the first thing to remember is that in general in any government but in particular in this government a budget is not the kind of value added document or event that most people think it is okay if you look back at the last 3 uh, 4 years of this government nowhere in this history of last 6 years of this government have the major decisions been made during the budget the question you ask is why do you need the budget you know you you go through the motions of a budget where you pretend to show some numbers and at least in the old days the numbers were kind of fairly accurate in fact uh, let me be very specific the major decision such as demonetization such as the onset of gst okay. such as you know recent kind of subsidies and grants and relief farm. packages such as the farm bill such as the environmental bill such as the employment bill such as the education bill huh. all of these are made independent of the budget and then they say something completely different the national education policy puts some target for what percentage of gdp should be put into education but then the budget doesn't come anywhere near that kind of percent of gdp very so very it's like you know the left hand the right hand the left leg the right leg operated by different human beings all allegedly in the same government so the budget itself has become a bit of a side show there's a further problem that because of the extent of off balance sheet activities from the nssf from the you know at the food corporation of india uh you know at uh, kind of financial jugglery of what date what account is uh, accrued and posted and so forth the budget numbers were meaningless now to be fair i am not 100% convinced but uh, reasonably credible people have suggested that the government is moving towards greater transparency and for the first time this year they actually cut the out the fci was added points. actually uh, the fci yeah. 27000 crore so was added that, this time i'll take their word for it and I, i take it as a sign of good faith but i'm saying you know what little of the value of the budget as i say already by the fact that policy is made outside the budget what little of the value is left some of that was shredded by the quality of the numbers there's another problem which is that these budgets now they've moved it from uh, kind of 1st of march to 1st of february Huh. which means that if you're really lucky you have good numbers for december you know the government of india struggles even though we're all cash accounting huh. the government of india the accountant general's office for the states and the center struggles to do accounts 30 days uh, after the close of the month so if you look at the year end accounts for example for a year that ends march 31st fiscal year that ends march 31st you are lucky if you get the accounts by september 30th closed so the monthly accounts if uh, you're looking at uh, december 31st close you're lucky if they are reasonably accurate on jan 31st 
if you have to present a budget by February 1st and it goes to print by, let's say, January 15th or January 20th, then the numbers are really only up to like November. Even the, you know, some experts think that they're up to December. I don't believe it. My personal experience on the Public Accounts Committee and working closely with the CAG's office, my best guess is that the government only has real data till the end of November by the time it starts preparing its budget during the month of January. So when you look at these revised estimates, you know, of where they think they're going to end up, the amount of variability is huge. It is immense. So you start with a budget that we already know has a lot of funny money accounting in it. Then you come up with a revised estimate that by definition has got all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, gross estimations with low probability of being accurate. Uh, Professor Jayati Ghosh had written an article last night where she said, if you look at the revised estimates, something like 40% of the alleged year-end revenue and 30-something percent of the alleged year-end expenditure, or rather the other way around, 40% of the expenditure and 30% of the revenue, have not yet been realized as of December 31st. So if you look at a year and you say, you know, the last three months, the numbers are just un unbelievable and the gross estimates, and many people have pointed this out. I actually, just to put the last word on that, I have already made these observations in the Tamil Nadu Assembly back in 2017 and continuously since then, saying that the government of Tamil Nadu seems to have lost its ability to do proper financial accounting, either estimating, executing, or accounting, because the variability between forecast and budget, between budget and revised estimate, and between revised estimate and final account are so huge, 20, 30, 40 percent. Uh, the numbers are almost meaningless when we see the revised estimate. So for all those reasons, I don't put that much stock in this budget, basically. But there's one uh, important point, which, you know, the numbers are there and it's, it's right on our face. Uh, we are the federal. We believe in uh, highlighting issues of uh, the federal, uh, issues of federal nature in our country. And in this connection, I'd like to ask you about uh, the use of CES as a method to collect revenue. Uh, is this not fundamentally against the principles of federalism? And uh, what would your views on this be? And I would also like you to comment on the fuel cess. Uh, uh, you know, literally every fuel, our petrol bunk seems to be doing the job of the tax collectors. So, uh, you know, a few comments on that also, please. While I may doubt the numbers, there's no questioning the intent that the government expresses. Why would we believe that they express an intent uh, that they don't intend to carry out, especially when it comes at the expense of the states. So the government has been very clear in their intent that they are increasingly seeing the government of India as the mother and father and the owner of all revenues and all receipts. So the, the extent of taxation that is uh, attributable to cesses has kept on increasing. Uh, this is not a problem that we decided yesterday or, or day before. When the 15th Finance Commission came to Tamil Nadu to have hearings, I, on behalf of the DMK, as well as uh, Rajya Sabha and PTK Rangarajan, on behalf of the CPM, made the same point, that if you keep on increasing the cess amounts, then by the definition that the cesses are not shareable to the states, you are basically robbing the states of our revenue, right? And there's, you know, the whole, uh, whole notion of federalism is uh, broken and the, the notion of cesses are a betrayal of federalism. Now, you take that one step further, at least when the UPA was there, and you know, and, and my principles are my principles, so I was no, no great fan of cesses when Mr. Chidambaram did it, and I'm certainly not a fan of cesses when Mr. Modi accelerates it to 5x or 10x. Huh. But beyond that, the question is, at least in the UPA days, when they collected a cess for a specific purpose, that was the quid pro quo. The fact that you could exclude it, exclude it from the states was that you designated a specific purpose and they actually used it for that purpose. The CAG's report has shown that over the last five or six years, uh, some huge amount of money, several lakh crores, have not been spent for the purpose that the cess said they were collected for. You know, so it's like a, a triple sin. The first sin, you remove it from the share of taxable, uh, shareable taxes by calling it a cess. Second, you don't use it for the purpose that it was intended. Neither the Swachh Bharat, nor the Krishkalya, nor any of these other cesses have ever been used for the purpose that they were said to be used. And then the third sin is 
after not using it to build toilets, after not using it to uh, uh, you know improve schools, the central government just rolls it back into its own income and doesn't share it. So it's like a backdoor way to avoid paying the states and using the notion of a special purpose segregation of cess as an outright lie in many cases. Uh, and the central government has admitted this to the CAG, that you're right, we did not use it the way that the CES was designed for. So, uh, last question. Uh, we have seen that there seems to be no other option. She increased the CES in uh, fuel. Thankfully, the income tax was, uh, other taxes were not raised. Uh, but another aspect is that of the divestment. Uh, now, we are not seeing too many nuanced arguments when it comes to divestment. It either is binary this side or uh, the other side. What are your views per se on uh, divestment or what they started, they use a new term, this term called asset monetization. And where do you see this going forward? Look, uh, broadly speaking, I am not uh, completely opposed to privatization or disinvestment. I think that when the country started out, it started out with a particular model where it saw the state as not just being the provider of public goods and services, but being the kind of uh, uh, owner of a whole bunch of uh, businesses that should otherwise be in the commercial uh, line. So from that perspective, I am not in principle opposed to privatization of any sort. I think there's nuanced discussions to be had about privatization. But as far as this government is concerned, I have two or three observations to make. The first is, you know, this government, for all it criticizes its predecessors and claims that, you know, the sun and the moon were first invented after 2014 and Mr. Modi became prime minister, has been monetizing assets that were built by their predecessors. You know, these guys have built nothing. You know, to put it simply, those who have the capacity build, those who are not even fit to maintain, sell. Right? So it's like the wasteful generation of a long-standing family who come and liquidate the, the assets built up over generations because they're incompetent and cannot kind of earn their own living. It's like selling the family silver. So in that sense, it is a kind of shame and, and an indication of the incompetence and gross inadequacy of administration of this government that they are forced to liquidate ever-increasing amounts and put targets. It is another matter that they never hit their target. Last year, of course, one could argue that the, uh, the, the pandemic deprived a lot of things, but the markets were soaring. Liquidity was flush all over the world. Central banks were pumping away. All the markets were hitting Do you new think it is a missed opportunity? Market. Of course it's a missed opportunity. Of course it is. Why did the market or government not take advantage of it? Because they're incompetent. Now I say the third thing is, the way they have been going about this is very, very suspect. Already we have the situation where unlike any other democracy in the world, you can have unlimited anonymous transactions for donations to political parties irrespective of conflict of interest. We don't know who's giving. How do we know if they have conflict of interest or not through these electoral bonds? Okay. Thousands of crores are given to the ruling party by who we assume are, or we have to presume as worst case, are interested parties who have transactions pending before the government. So already you have a system that is primed for corruption and quid pro quo in an organized mafia kind of systematic through the banking system way. In that system, you now go and start privatizing these institutions after the government has stripped them bare. You take places like ONGC or you yeah. take places like Bharat Petroleum. This government has already driven the balance sheet of these companies into the ground. Companies that were worth 10x or 20x three years, five years, seven years ago have been reduced to mere shells because the government has already stripped all the assets and the liquidity out of them. Now they will sell them at distressed sales. To whom? Using this notion of Atma, Nirbar, whatever it is, they basically sell it to their own uh, cronies who have been giving them electoral bond donations. Right? Here is a, uh, this thing that says self-reliance. My Sanskrit is not that good, so I don't understand what that slogan is. But the implication is they say self-reliance on the one hand. Then they say, no, no. In insurance, which is the most crucial of sensitive financial sectors in the country, they say we're going to increase the foreign direct investment limit from 49 to 74%. I mean, it's like a lunatic, right? Morning, he gets up and says, very hot. One minute later, he says, no, no, I'm boiling. No, no, it's too uh, cold. No, no, it's, I'm freezing. No, no, it's, it's like nonsense, right? How can one government say on the one hand, I am self-reliance is my goal. And the other hand, say, I'm going to open up the insurance sector, life insurance, pensions, health insurance, long-term investment, 
the key holder of long-term assets, they're going to open that up to foreign direct investment from 49 to 74%. So it, it's like watching a lunatic kind of run around in circles sometimes when their actions and their words completely mismatch each other. And I'm completely, you know, uh, concerned, very concerned that in the liquidation of these assets built up over generations and governments that were much more competent than them, huh. they're going to end up doing distress sales for pennies on the dollar or paisa on the rupee of the equivalent of the people's family silver uh, to their cronies, right? And that, I think, is a real risk in this year's uh, privatization game. Dr. PTR, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you once again. Thanks for the time. Thank, yeah, you. thank you.